All right, the topic today, which thanks to John and Mike and some stuff that I've acquired, deals with the issue of Colt revolvers to the U.S. military. Colt. All right? This is going to act up on me today. It sometimes does. Yeah, it's locked up for some reason. And I don't know why. All right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what happened to it. It just... So yeah. Yeah. No. All right. For whatever reason. All right. All right. With all this excitement, did I fire five? Then I fire six. Now, since this is a Colt Walker, the most powerful handgun in the world, and capable of killing a horse at 100 yards, but it has cylinders that tend to explode in your face. A question I have to ask is, do I feel lucky? <laughs> okay? So the 1847 Walker was the first revolver that the US military purchased. And it was not designed to be worn on your hip. When I got this gun, it came with a holster and I sat on it and realized, no good. The only person I know of who could carry two of these and look cool that's Clint Eastwood and the outlaw Josie Wales. Nobody else would bother making this a belt gun because it wasn't designed for that. It was designed to be carried on pommel holsters. You carry two of these and a saber and a carbine and it gave you a lot of firepower, but it had a lot of problems. One was its weight. Two, the loading lever can drop down when you fire it, jamming it, even though this one's jammed already, uh, the cylinder is exploding because guys would sometimes put the conical bullets in upside down so they could squeeze more powder into it. All right, so Colt went back and unfortunately nobody here got me a Dragoon, which was an attempt to give him a little lighter and safer gun. All right, with a loading lever that didn't drop back. Colt in 1851 came out with what's called the Navy. There's a bunch of them here on the table. He brought one too. But the Navy was the first Colt, one of the first Colt guns designed to be worn on the belt. All right, Wild Bill Hickok, Robert E. Lee, a lot of people liked it. And I was under the impression our government didn't buy them, but recently IMA has one for sale. It's US surcharge. Okay, so they must have. And again, now you had a gun you could carry on your belt rather than on your horse, all right? But when the war started, Colt had to create a bigger, more expensive, build their heavier gun, and that's where you get to your 1860 Army, which is another couple over there, all right? And then these were made till about 1863 when the fire broke out at the Colt plant, and then they started production again after the war. The problem Colt had is Samuel Colt had fired a guy called Rollins, White, yeah, Rollins White, who then worked for Smith & Wesson and patented the cylinder that could take cartridges. So Colt had to wait till the patent expired, which was supposed to expire in 1869, but old Rollins White and Smith & Wesson went to court and played around and were able to get two more years out of it. So Colt was stuck with percussion guns when the world was now looking for cartridge guns for the military. And of course, the Colt 1860 was the, the favorite gun. And then they also used Remingtons, all right? Now, after the war, luckily people brought me some. Comes the famous single action army, the gun that won the real West, R-E-E-L, like in Hollywood, all right? They liked it, the government was happy with it. It had a service life of about 20 years, and of course has gone down into legend. Now, the military said, we got something that can be double action and faster to reload. And Colt had their Thunderer or some other guns that weren't that good. And they designed what became the new army revolver, which is over here. Hey, my day 
Gate of Gun Jokes. Okay. Anyway, the Colt New Army, which kind of fired their own special 38, 30 cal, 20 caliber, 38 revolver bolt cartridges for Colt's double action revolver, smokeless powder. And I even have a reprint of the manual, Colt's double action revolver. And um, it had some problems. The very early ones didn't, didn't have a cylinder lock. They took care of that. This one here is the Model 1896. Colt was told, put a lanyard on it. They forgot. So a bunch of these were made without a lanyard. And we're going to get into later on. They're going to change that. And a lot of times you'll get messed up as a collector, like I did my very first one of these. The serial number told me it was made in 1892. But on the bottom it said Model 1901. A lot of these <coughs> were sent back. They buffed off all the markings, put a lanyard in, moved the serial number down, and... Um, created what's called the 1901 model. Now, when they went to the Spanish-American War, the gun worked okay, but when they got to the Philippines, it didn't. All right? And as a solution, they took the single-action armies, there's one over there too, and cut the barrel, they wanted to cut the barrel down to like four inches, and Colt told them, don't. We make them with five and a half, we already have five and a half, no, we can recondition them, we're gonna mix the parts up. We're not gonna have matching numbers anymore. But we can make you a, a decent uh, single action army with a five and a half inch barrel and they're commonly referred to as the artillery model. And this became the gun that soldiers would be issued or sometimes officers would buy if they were going to the Philippines, all right? In the Philippines, constant complaint that the 38 doesn't stop them particularly when they're going juramentado, which is a mixture of drugs and religious zeal. You still killed them, but they stabbed you first, all right? In like what we've now called stopping power. So they said, we're gonna have to go to 45 again, but we want double action. And Cole said, mm, no problem. We'll give you a double action 45, but it's not gonna have a swing out cylinder, and it needs a very strong mainspring and what sometimes people call the Alaskan model. Never sent to Alaska. It's the Philippine model. The reason it's got this big trigger guard and this trigger, they expected you to put two fingers on it. Particularly if you were a Filipino, a small stature. But the gun was really designed for the Philippine constabulary. It loads with a loading gate. Okay, it's got an ejector rod. Now, why the constabulary and not the army? Because we were trying to create a fantasy. The fantasy was there is no insurrection. It ended. We captured Equinaldo. There is no insurrection. The Filipinos love being controlled by a new master. But there's a lot of criminals out there. So we gotta send the police after them. So that's the Philippine constabulary, which would then be backed up by the army. But this gun, 1902, was to be issued to the constabulary. Well, still complaints from the army. They want a gun. Well, we're working on it. We're working on it. We're working on a, it's going to be a 45. It's going to be a semi-automatic. Don't worry. It's coming. It's coming. They're going, we can't wait. So, in 1909, all right, Colt told the government, we make uh, new service revolvers in 45 Colt. Would you like some? So they went out and bought, I think it's 15,000 of them. I might, don't quote me too much on that one there, but 300 were kept at Springfield Army. All the rest were sent to the Philippines. This was not a general issued pistol. They basically decided they needed a gun for the Philippines. Now, they also, okay, it's 45 long Colts, which the New York State Police use and everybody else. But the Army was not happy with the ammunition. They created their own 45 ammunition. It's a box of 20 caliber 45 revolver bolt cartridges, model of 1909, for Colts double action revolver, model of 1909, smokeless powder. How was it different? It had a wider rim. 
It had a wider rim, so they were sure it would eject because it did not have an ejection rod that pushed the cartridge out of the middle. So they created a special round. Here is the problem. If you take a cylinder for either a 1902 or a single action and you try to load the 1909 ammo, you can't. They start stacking up. So you convert your six shooter to a three shooter if you use 1909 ammunition. 1911, the United States goes to an automatic. Problem solved. World War I rolls along. General Pershing had been a cavalryman. He was used to having two guns, a carbine and a handgun. Who else a saber? All right? And he wanted the American Army to have every soldier equipped with a handgun. You're going to create a four million man army, you're going to need a lot of guns. All right? Well, one of the things they did is they called out the new navies again and told Colt, can you clean these up? And then Colt goes, you crazy? We're making BAR, we're making machine guns, we're making 1911s, we're making a new service. So they go to Remington, and you will find a good number of these guns marked LEB for Lawrence E. Briggs, and there's another inspector whose name escapes me now, I think his initials are EEC. But they reconditioned these 38 guns. Now why would they want 38 guns? Because they were, they were still a lot of them in the system, the Navy got a lot of them, rear echelon troops got them, but they were not going to be used for frontline action. But if you run into them and they're marked LED, there were guns that were, in 1918, were refurbished. Colt said, you need some more guns, we got Colt new service. We'll give you a 1909 model again. And they go, we don't want to add that cartridge back into the system. What can you do for us? Smith and Wesson has already designed that they can convert their revolvers to take 45 ACP. So, Colt designs a gun that takes 45 ACP uh, in the half moon clips. If you get an early one, and I've seen a couple of them here in the club, if you drop a 45 round in it, it goes right through. It has to have the half moon clip. Smith and Wesson's don't. Colt later modified their gun so you can fire them Without the half moon clips, just got to poke the empties out with a pencil. But this became a secondary arm for use with the 1911. All right? Now, the war ends. We're now at this big stockpile of 1911s and a good stockpile of 1917s, good stockpile of new Navy revolvers, and we even have some 1909s. A decision is made in 1920 21 period. Get rid of all the 38 Colts. Sell them off. Some were modified four inches and made security guns for us to sell them off. 1909s, sell them off. <coughs> to the best of my knowledge, they were all gone. Just this week, I was studying the Philippine guerrilla movement, and there was an American officer by the name of Childless, I think it is, or Childless. He carried a 1909. He still had one. But basically, they're out of the system. What are we going to do with all these other, with these revolvers? Decision was made that we would take the 1917 revolvers and they would be our war reserve, along with 1917 Enfields. But during the 1920s and 30s, interagency transfers to save the taxpayer money. Colt 1917s went to the post office, border patrol, uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons. All right, so they were being distributed all right, World War II rolls along, Lend-Lease, for some, whatever reason, we sent basically Smith & Wesson 1917s, most of them went to the British, we kept the Colts. All right, same situation, what are we going to do with the war? Well, we have to recondition, this one here is a recondition 1917. Okay, it still has its original grips, but it has varnish on it, that's another way you spot them, usually they have varnish. Some were reconditioned by Colt, they were reblued and they were given wooden checkered grips, okay? But this one here has the smooth grips with the lacquer and it's parkerized, all right? There was also a demand for more and more handguns in 38 because the Navy wanted them for old flyers. The Army flyers had 1911s. The Navy wanted revolvers. And 
mostly Smith and Wesson. But there was an accident where a sailor dropped his Smith and Wesson in a discharge and he killed another sailor. And Colt said, well, we didn't need a good official police. And they go, your guns are too expensive. So what they did is Colt created what's called the Colt Commando. Now, there's all sorts of rumors and stories about these. Nobody's really done the research yet, I think, down at the Colt factory. Because give you an example. This one has an ordnance bomb. Went to the Army. I get a Colt letter. It went to Westinghouse in Newark. Okay? Um, and it was serial numbers, like 1,000-something. And like the first 1,000 guns were sent to the OSS. I said, oh, good, I probably got an OSS one. No, no, I got one that went to Westinghouse. All right, um, there's a lot, still a lot of research. They, they, pe people claim, well, if it's got the ordnance bomb, those went to the army, doesn't have the ordnance bomb, it went to uh, military factories, whatever. Um, there's three variations. Like this, four inch. Like this, two inch from the factory, which was called the Colt Junior Commando. And then after the war, they took a lot of the four inchers and made them into two inchers. So that's the third variation. There's the four inch original, two-inch original and a two-inch pseudo made from a four-inch. Plastic grips, parkerized finish, uh, some other fine points were taken off to keep the price down. But the Colt Commando was the gun. All right, World War II ends. What are we going to do now? Well, we got enough 1911 A1s and 1911s. So the word goes out to all the different branches, what handguns do we need? And everybody says, 1911's fine, 1911's fine, 1911's fine. Provo Marshall goes, I like the revolver. <laughs> so, I got some manuals here. This one here is from 1941. Revolver, Colt, caliber 45, not M19, 17, and Revolver, Smith and Wesson, caliber 45, 1917. So we know they got used during the Second World War. In 1953, <coughs> Pistols and revolvers, FM 23-35, list the following as guns that we had. And it's the 1911, 1911A1, and then it's got Colt revolver, Colt caliber 38, two inch barrel, detective special. And it's also got the 1917 Colt and Smith and Wesson. Because they were still in the system in the, in the early 1950s, all right? Now, they mentioned the Detective Special. All right, this here is a Detective Special. All right. Now, the manual for 1952 shows one of these with the rounded grips in plastic. The unit I was in, I'm going to explain this one in a while, but the unit I was in, 502nd MP Company, 2nd Armored Division, Fort Hood, Texas, and I was temporarily maybe Assistant Company Armor, we had two Colt Detective Specials. Plastic grips. One of our Provo Marshal investigators, PMI, now they're called MP investigators, MPI. We also had CID agents, and they used to fight over the two guns we had. And one of them on a mission either clubbed somebody or did something because it was a big hush hush investigation. Anyway, we got his gun back, and the plastic grips were broken. So, being armors, we went through the supply catalog and ordered grips. And sure enough, we got brand new Colt wood checkered grips. Trouble was, they were made for the models that came out after 1965, I think it was, or 1955, the short frame. We had a full frame early gun. So the other armorer, well, I'm glad it's, his fingerprints are on it, not mine. He took the grips, took a saw, saw it off the bottom, started filing it down, made an ugly mess out of it, and screwed him on the gun and put it back in the system. A year or two, two years later, I joined the 50th MP Company, 50th Armored Division, New Jersey National Guard. Same T.O. and E is the unit I left. We had two Colt Detective Specials. Where are they? I don't know. They're on the property book. Oh, they're on permanent hand receipt to division, uh, to state headquarters. So I never got to see them. Now, the manual we had showed a square frame detective special like this with the half moon front sight. Uh, in the 1943-44 period, the government bought over 5,000 Colt detective specials, but it specified square grip. 
When the gun was first made, it came with a square grip or a rounded grip. Nobody wanted to buy the square grip, so Colt dropped it. But Uncle Sam in 1943 said, square grip, square grip. And in the manual, they actually showed us with, with the uh, grip adapter, and they recommended that you get the grip adapter. So this gun here, I got a Colt letter. This is an OSS gun. Most of these were sent to either Office of Strategic Services, Counterintelligence, or Military Intelligence. When the OSS was disbanded, a lot of these guns went to Military Intelligence. Now, my very first one of these, I was still the Assistant Company Armorer, and I went to a pawn shop in Belton, Texas, and there was one of these square frame, gray parkerized finish, and on the bottom of the grip, RA-P. Raritan Arsenal. And it was kind of rough in the back, and the owner goes, yeah, parkerization covers a lot of sins. And it was very rough in the back, and had been parkerized. So I bought the gun, brought it back to my arms room, and of course the CID PMI thought it was theirs. No, 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 private purchase, sorry. And since they were nagging me about it, when I got home, when I had to go home for Christmas, I stuck it in my duffel bag and brought it back to New Jersey. Um, I, for a while I was a police officer and I carried an official police, so I carried the gun off duty, my backup. Then one day I decided to splurge and I sent a letter to Colt. They come back and they tell me it's an OSS gun. So neatly had to be handled gently, put aside. Uh, about 10 years later, I go to a gun shop and I see a square frame. Oh, that'd be nice to have. So I bought it. Send away for a cold letter. The letter comes back and I'm cursing myself back and forth. You fucking idiot. You sent the serial number of the first gun, didn't you? No, I had two guns in the same shipment. <laughs> Five years later, I go back to that same gun shop. They have another one of these, square frame. I vote for the Colt letter. Another shipment that came two weeks before the first shipment, so okay. <laughs> so I have three OSS square frame guns like this. Um, in 1970, a whole bunch of these were purchased, detective specials, uh, and sent to letter Kenny Arsenal. And here's the thing, there's no marking on them, guys. If you run into an official police, you can't tell whether it was one that, they didn't mark them U.S. government or anything else because they were supposed to be for undercover work. But if you're a collector, uh, if you see any with square frame, it's either very early 1930s, it's one of the ones that were purchased for World War II. Uh, in my arms room, we had holsters. Now the manual showed you a tan holster. We never had them. All we had was this piece of crap. And we had more of them than we had guns because the automatic supply system just kept sending them to us. And none of the agents wanted to wear this piece of crap. They all had friends on the police force. They were wearing Buckheimers, Safari Land. They would sign out the gun, never a holster. But this was the official military holster for the detective special. It has no maker's name. I can understand. I'd be embarrassed if this was my company. No stock number or anything else. You can examine it a little later. And CID badge. Very impressive, isn't it? I took the CID supervisor course at Fort McClellan. There was a store right outside the base that sold your badges. <laughs> <laughs> Thought, I had to buy one. But uh, that's the history of Colt. We start out with the Walker in 1847, and we end up with a detective special by the 1970s. But at that point, Colt was having a lot of problems. Uh, what happened to revolvers in the military? Smith and Wesson basically took over. Uh, 1980, the technical manual on revolvers listed Model 10 two inch round grip, model 10 four inch uh, square grip, model 10 four inch small grip. They were being issued, they were supposed to be issued to female MPs. I was in an MP company, we never saw them. But if you were a male, you got a 1911. If you were a female, you were supposed to get a model 10 small grip four inch revolver. And then they had two Ruger pistols. By 1988, when they came out with the 
Combat Training Pistols and Revolvers Manual, 1988, which was really a great manual. You could see they had really advanced. These were more geared toward target shooting, you could tell. This was a good combat manual. They only listed three guns. 1911, A1. Beretta M9, Smith & Wesson, four inch, small grip. The revolver was being phased out. They're finished now. I think the new, the new Six Sour that's replacing the Beretta has different size grips or something, so you can modify it for smaller hands, larger hands. But uh, this is a quick history of Colt revolvers and U.S. military service. I will try to answer some questions. <coughs> yes, back there. When the guy dropped the gun on the deck, that yeah. what happened to anybody here with one of those guns. After they changed the design, it had a, it had a safety in the, in the side plane. And it would cam back into the side plane. They used grease. The grease would turn to varnish. It didn't cam back out of the side plane. That's why the gun went. So they changed it. They stamped the VS for safety. So if anybody's got one of those guns, make sure that safety's free. The, um, yeah, Colt, it's something I, I forgot to get into. The Colt New Army U Navy, Colt revolvers rotated to the right. But when they made the new Navy, they rotated to the left. And they don't know why, they, but Smith and Wesson's rotated to the left. So they decided, there must be a reason why Smith and Wesson does it. <laughs> so we'll do it. The problem was Smith and Wesson had a way to lock up the ejector rod in the front. This doesn't, it. it just hangs there. And one of the arguments was that every time you fired it, you were rotating away from the frame, okay? And then later on, Colt decided to go back to right-hand rotation. If you get a new Army, new Navy, the other thing with a new Army, new Navy, just, you know, I'm gonna warn everybody. Years ago, a guy tried to sell me, goes, you wanna buy a Remington 357 Magnum revolver? What are you talking about? He had one of these, four inch barrel, and he found out a chamber 357. And I said, what makes you think it's a Remington? Right there, RAC, Remington Arms Corporation. Uh, Ronaldo A. Carr. <laughs> Colt inspector for the military. No, 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 no. Yes, if you have one of these guns, it will chamber 38 special, it will chamber 37 Magnum. Don't do it. Don't do it. But um, Colt tried to modify the gun in 1903 model. They put a tighter barrel on it. They felt that would increase the capability. It wasn't enough. The 38 Special was uh, just surpassing in so many ways that uh, like I said, it's really an obsolete, uh, obsolete caliber, obsolete design. It led eventually to the official Army Special, official police, and so forth. But at the time, Colt thought he had a winner there with a double action swing out cylinder. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just to go back to the uh, single action on the uh, 73, actually, uh, the government modified 1,200. Mm -hmm. 600 were modified by Colt, 600 were modified by Springfield Arsenal. And a great percentage of those went directly to the Philippines. Oh, yeah. yeah. Speaking of which, they had a lot of problems in the beginning with the Colt New Army New Navy, okay? Now, there was a situation. Colt modified the guns and made them better and was going to charge like $3 to modify it. The Army goes, uh, the parts only cost a buck and a half and we can do it ourselves. And Colt goes, well, we're not selling you the parts. They're not replacement parts because they're made for the older gun. We'll sell you replacement parts if you buy our new guns, but we're not going to buy sell you parts to upgrade the old gun to new standards. And that was a fight back and forth for quite a while. I don't know how they, they finally settled it somehow where Rock Island, uh, I think it was Rock Island Arsenal started modifying the uh, new Army, new Navy to a safety standard. The poll for a long time was, oh, no, 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 no. When we sell you a gun, we sell you the parts, um, we, we don't expect you to, you need many replacement parts. Now you want, you know, 5,000 replacement parts because you're gonna redo all the guns. We'll do it for you. Typical back and forth, you know, private sector, government sector. We can do it cheaper. Anything else, Dad? 
in the late 1950s, the Postal Department had a lot of Smith and Wesson in 1917 and cold 1970. Right. Up until that point, when you sort of nail on a train, you had to have a revolver. And somebody said in the late 50s, when was the last train hold up? <laughs> so the Post Office Department Which released all these uh, 1917 Colts and Smith and Westons. And I remember Humphrey had a, a peach basket full of them, and for 30 bucks a piece, you could pick out any one you wanted. And that's right. when I got my 17. Yeah. Orlando, you said you saw some 17s in Vietnam? And also uh, the victory models. You know who used to carry them? The aviation. Unit. Yeah, aviation kept victory models for quite a while. I had a, again, when I was in the company armor, we had some manuals, and they showed the victory models. This is 1970, 71. They, uh, they had a vest that they wore. Right. And they had a, a shoulder holster, and they carried either the, I saw some of them carry the Cold Commando, too. Okay. But mostly it was uh, victory models. Yeah. And the, the, Provo Marshal in the 1950s, whoever it was, decided he really didn't need Colt 1917 revolvers for MP, so they were getting rid of them. And um, the Border Patrol, a lot of guys didn't like them. They felt they were too heavy. They preferred a 38 or a 37 Magnum. The Post Office decided they really didn't need to have these big guns. So again, the late 1950s, early 60s, 17s were all over the place. And um, you know, now of course they're you know they're in private hands, but a uh, good number of them uh, were just released. When I was with the first division in Riley, there was some M female MPs that were issued at 38. Because I remember that, and they kind of complained about it. They said, no, no, we want 45. So they were... you didn't have female MPs till the 70s. And the and the. Uh, oh, admit, maybe air police, but I know. No, no, and this was the 70, 73, 74 before Riley canceled. All right, I do know in the mid-70s, you know, my MP company, we were given female MPs, but they were pre-mobilization only. No, we had, they had MPs. Yeah. And, but they were issued uh, revolvers, but they complained and said, okay, you took 45. Well, we had, our, 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 our M female MPs were trained under 45 because we couldn't get the revolvers. Yeah. They wouldn't send us any. Then they, they bitch about it. So, right, so we had no, nobody bitched, but they, they, you know, we just couldn't get them the revolvers. They. They didn't send them to us. But again, the emphasis here is on Colt. We're going to have a presentation in the spring on police revolvers, right? Rich, you and me, and the others. Uh, we'll see the battle between Colt and Smith and Wesson. I know myself, 1971, I was taking a course called Firearms and Defensive Tactics at Central Texas College. And the instructors were just ranting about Colt. Quality had gone to shit as far as they were concerned. And they were telling us, don't even think of buying a Colt. You know, they, they, their quality went downhill, uh, you know. And uh, they were just ranting about Colts all the time. Uh, I was issued a Colt official police. Uh, mine was probably an old gun, probably from the 50s, and it worked fine. But uh, the Colt company ran into a lot of troubles. They lost a lot of skilled workers, and there were a lot of labor problems. And I think they went bankrupt in 92 or something like that. But as far as providing revolvers, detective specials were really the last cult revolvers. Mm -hmm. And I think the last purchase order was 1970. And um, the revolver's gone the way of the saber and the battleship, okay? It's, it's history, it's nice. But uh, you know everybody's gonna have semi-automatics. And actually the new Sig Sauer, I think it is, isn't it? Who? Sig 320. Okay. Is it 320 it's called? Okay. That's a commercial. Yeah, the commercial. Right. right. M18, M17. M17, both of them. Yeah, because we, we had the Beretta, and for CID and everybody else, officers, they had the Sig Sauer P228, which is called, what, the M11? Yeah. Yeah. I, I have the P320, and the thing with the P20s is it's, uh, you can change it to any caliber, any size, anything you it's want. Modular, yeah. It's modular. Basically. modular. Yeah. yeah, the guts come out, and you just okay. swap around. Uh, gentlemen, we have a display up here. You can come and take a look at them and ask any questions and so forth. We don't have any other questions. One afterward. What? Uh, in the early 70s, the Smith & Wessons were pretty piss poor. <laughs> okay. They were piss poor, yeah, too. Yeah, the ones we got at the department. <coughs> I know. I was in the department in the mid-70s, and uh, everybody wanted Smith & Wesson stainless. Yeah, that became the in thing. When I got my first revolver, I wanted to get Dan Wesson. Okay, Dan Wesson.
Uh, for a while, the military even bought damn weapons. Yeah, I forgot that. All right, anybody else, any questions?